Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, you know, tonight's, tonight's kind of a special night for me. Um, tonight, I celebrate 20 years sober. Um, and I, I just want to say that there's a lot of people that lost a lot of money on that bet. You know, um, if you'd have seen me in my first couple of years, you, you wouldn't have been rooting for me uh, to be one of the long timers in Alcoholics Anonymous. But, uh, you know, I found a home here. I found a way of life uh, that's just incredible. Uh, incredible things have happened uh, over the over the past 20 years. Uh, the scales have been balanced. You know, I came into uh, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous really feeling like uh, I had been a scumbag most of my life, and I and I'd taken more than I'd given, and I'd let a lot of people down, and I'd robbed people of emotional and financial security, and my self esteem was in the toilet. And uh, I thought that, you know, there's probably going to be no way I'm ever going to be able to redeem myself uh, to, to these people. And, uh, and actually, you know, uh, that, that certainly, certainly was possible. Um, you know, I want to I say something about, uh, uh, about my friend Bill over here who isn't here. Uh, uh, I want to say something about tapers because... Um, my, my life was was basically saved uh, by someone who handed me a set of workshop tapes. I had been in Alcoholics Anonymous about a year, and I wasn't going to last much longer. Uh, my problem was is uh, I, I fit the description of the real alcoholic in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I was a hopeless case. Uh, uh, you know, everything in my life was ugly, and I was hanging on by a thread. I was staying sober by going to a million meetings. I, I was going to like 13 meetings a week. I was a coffee maker over here. I was a treasurer over here. And I was going out to the diner with the guys afterward. I mean, I was throwing myself into the fellowship. But if you're a real alcoholic, the, that fellowship stuff, at most, it can keep you sober. It's not going to offer you uh, recovery and, and freedom uh, the way... Uh, the way the step process uh, will. And this guy gave me a set of tapes, and I started to listen to them. Um, and they talked about uh, a program of recovery. Now, I used to hear in the meetings all the time, people would say, you know, when I came in the program, you know, so, so I thought the program was going to a lot of meetings and doing all the meeting stuff. Well, well, these tapes said, no, that's not a program. If, if you think you're working your program because you're going to meetings, you are sadly mistaken. You are engaging in the fellowship. And the program of recovery is in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're not engaged in that recovery program, then you're not working in AA program. And you have no reason to believe you're going to stay sober. And, and you cannot blame it on Alcoholics Anonymous if you get drunk because... It's a 12-step uh, fellowship and program, and if you're not working the 12 steps, you, you have no, you know, you have no right to expect it to work. Now, this is what this is the message these tapes gave me, and I, you know, first thing that happened was I got really pissed because you know that's not how we do it in New Jersey. You know, we go we go to a lot of meetings. You know, we're, I don't know who these people think they are. You know, uh, and. Um, but but what happened was those tapes haunted me, and there's there's a line in the in the chapter working with others. If you've disturbed someone about their alcoholism, this is all to the good, you know. So if you disturb somebody and you throw a little bit of truth in front of them that they have to deal with, that's a good thing because that's kind of how we move forward. Um, another thing that I like a lot is the, the set aside prayer. Now, I, I don't say this often, but the first group that used the set-aside prayer that I know of anywhere was was my home group. And that happened when we started that home group in 1997. 
uh, that set aside prayer actually came from a workshop that I had heard on a series of tapes that, believe me, nobody else in New Jersey had at the time. And I wrote it down. And instead of doing the serenity prayer, uh, we decided to do uh, the set aside prayer. Because let me tell you, serenity is overrated. You know, I mean, that, we don't, that's not really what we need. We'll get that as a byproduct of working the steps. But to sit there and ask for it, you know, before you work the steps is stupid. So, you know, um, not that I judge, you know, not that I judge. Uh, uh, anyway, we decided uh, that, you know, the, the serenity prayer is great for touchy-feely, you know, type of meetings where everybody sits around in a circle like a bad Bob Newhart group and, you know, shares all their, shares all their crap, you know. Oh, my day was horrible. Oh. You know, give them the serenity prayer. But the people who were in real trouble with alcohol and who were relapsing and showing up at groups drunk and in and out of treatment and detoxes and drinking on the way home from treatment, those are the people Alcoholics Anonymous was designed for. It was designed to treat those hopeless cases. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we, started to get, we started to get very, very serious in this particular group about trying to help them. There's plenty of places where, where if all you have is a drinking problem and all you need to do is stop drinking and the problem's gone, there's tons of meetings for those people. But back, at, back in the mid-90s, there were really no meetings for the chronic, hopeless, relapsing, pathetic demoralized uh, alcoholic. And, you know, uh, I was uh, unfortunately uh, one of those guys. So, so when you hear the set-aside prayer, <clears throat> the value in that is, and where it comes from is, in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, it says, we beg of you to lay aside any prejudices you have on spiritual matters or even religion or religious people. Set aside those prejudices. You don't need to get rid of them. You know, we're not asking you to not think. What we're asking you to do is just whatever you think you know, just put it off to the side for one hour and be open to some information. Uh, because if you go, if you go into something already knowing, you can never learn. And I got to tell you, I work with a lot of newcomers and I'll, and, and I'll start talking to a newcomer about something and they'll go, yeah, yeah, I know. And, you know, and then they'll go on and on. And well, well, they don't know. They really, really think they know, but they don't. They're boneheads. Usually it's going to be many, many years before they're going to be thinking in any way near sane way. And they, and they just don't realize that because what happens in, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're a real alcoholic, what happens is you are, you're so sick, you don't even know you're sick. And then you start to get a little bit better. And then you're so sick, you think you're not as sick as some other people, you know? And then you go, that guy over there. And, and finally, finally, you'll get to a point where you'll realize that, that you're, you're sick and, you know, you're, you're engaged in a recovery program whereby you will be restored to sanity. But it takes work. The saddest thing I see in Alcoholics Anonymous today is people who sit in chairs and wait to get this thing through osmosis, you know. I, I, when I was first coming around, and, and you know, I, I came around in the 80s uh, for a while, you used to hear things like, you don't take the steps, the steps take you. Uh, and another really good one was, you know, you know take what you want, and leave the rest. Um, and and another, another really, really good one was, was you know, uh, it takes you five years to get your brains out of hock. Uh, I, you know, I never understood that one. <laughs> I found out after five years I'd lost the pawn ticket, you know, and I was I was like I was in real trouble. But you used to hear these little wisdom sayings. People used to just throw these things at you because they were too goddamn lazy to learn what a program of recovery was and actually help you to recover. It was just easier to say, keep it simple. You know what I mean? You know, and get out of my face. You know, I got I got my own problems. Uh, so. 
So anyway, you know, this, back to the set-aside prayer. The set-aside prayer. Set aside whatever you think you know so that you can be open to a new experience. In the spiritual world, and make no mistake about it, Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12-step process is about spiritual growth. We're not the only people that do it, folks. You know, there are, there are religions and philosophies and the Sufis do it and the Buddhists do it and the Christians do it. And, you know, and, and, you know, the, the people are studying the, all this stuff and, and inside of us is a, is a desire, a yearning to grow spiritually. It's part of our makeup, you know, and there are people doing it everywhere. But make no mistake about it, 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 it takes a lot of work. And we don't like work. You know what I mean? Another thing I used to hear, I, I, I was one of the first people who would raise my hand and start talking about the steps. I was one of the very first people to piss people off and be labeled a big book Nazi. You know, I was, I was way back in the beginning of that. You know? And um, uh, the, I used to hear people say, you know, if when I came into AA, I was told I had to do a bunch of steps, I had to do a bunch of work and all this stuff like this, you know, I would have just, I would just out the door. I would have, I would have split. I never would have stayed. And you know what I'm always thinking when I heard that was, buddy, you're assuming we need you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's a pretty big assumption you have there. You know. You're, you're, you're about as useless as, but then again, I don't judge. I don't judge. Now, the topic tonight, uh, the topic tonight is on, uh, on the disciplines of service. Now, here's, here's a, here's what I see as recovery. First of all, you have to surrender. Okay. I mean, there's a surrender and each of us has it kind of in our own way. Uh, uh, some of us are completely devastated. Some of us just don't want to feel bad anymore. You know, it really doesn't matter. But we have to come to a point where we, we have to recognize we can't just keep figuring our life out ourselves anymore. You get to a point where you realize, you know, whatever your life looks like right now, you know, that's the best you could do. And, you know, how is that working for you? You know? And you have to come to the conclusion that you've been shooting yourself in the foot and you've been, you've been driving the, you've been driving the ship onto the reef. And you have to come to some kind of surrender, which, which could be as much as, well, I guess I'll go get a sponsor and, you know, he'll have some guidance for me and, you know, I'll do it. I mean, it can be as, it can be as simple as that. Uh, but that surrender is necessary. Um, Harry Tebow, he was one of the uh, one, one of the guys who was very influential in Alcoholics Anonymous in in the 40s and 50s. <clears throat> he talked about the ne- necessity of ego deflation at death. Our egos are we usually come in here with a lack of self esteem, you know, because we've been you know acting like jerks for years and years and years. But we have this big ego, you know, like like you know we we really understand the world and and all its intricacies at a very deep and complicated level, you know. And and, and if and if and if people would just listen to us and you know follow follow the way we think things should go, everything would be fine, you know. That comes that comes from like a, a really big ego. You know, I, I, used to, I used to say to my first sponsor, you know, I think, and he would say something to me like, Chris, if I want to know what you think, I'd come over to your house, knock on the door and ask your mother if I could talk to you. <laughs> You're living at home with your mom, okay? <laughs> and, you know, and you, you want to explain to me the intricacies of life. I mean, oh, oh, you know, only somebody, only somebody with just a huge ego would be that pathetic, and uh, and that certainly was me in in, in the early days. Uh, so there's a surrender, and with that surrender, hopefully you find an experienced sponsor or spiritual advisor. 
You know, I heard, I heard uh, uh, Lisa to come up here tonight. Lisa's one of the experienced sponsors. And, and, you know, I hate to say it, but they're, they're few and far between out there in Alcoholics Anonymous today. I mean, if, if, if an individual hasn't gone through the steps, hasn't done their amends, don't pray and meditate, don't have a, have a service ethic, haven't done a complete fourth and fifth step, they, sh- they have no business sponsoring. You know, they really don't. Uh, they can be of infinite help and value to you. But as someone leading you through a recovery process, they have little value because they don't have any experience in it. So after the surrender, hopefully you'll get lucky enough to find somebody who, who can take you through the steps. Um, if you have a really great sponsor, here's my experience. I had a really great sponsor early on, but he didn't have any step experience. He was, he was not a powerless alcoholic. When he quit drinking, he quit drinking and he went to AA because, you know, it was, you know, it was a social thing and it made him feel better and he got a chance to be of service and all this. But when, when, you know, when I was asking him about the steps, I remember I, I, I said to him, I go, listen, I, you know, I, I need to do a fourth step. Uh, you know, what, what do you think? How do you do a fourth step? You do a fourth step with a pencil, Chris. <laughs> Well, well, thanks for that. I mean, you know, okay. Uh, and the reason he said that, because he didn't want to seem stupid. He had never really done one. He had done some stuff in treatment, you know, like a life story and, you know, stuff like that. He had never done a four step. So he, he, he couldn't give me any guidance. So I remember my first, my first experience with it was I went to the 12 and 12. It's got a whole chapter on the four step, right? You know, I mean, isn't that where you would go? And that's about the most confusing place you can go to learn how to do a four step. You know, it's, it's very, very detailed in the book, although it's not ex- probably not explained as, as well as it could have been. All the information for the four step is in there. But, you know, it's, it's not the way it would be written today if it was a Deepak Chopra book. You, you know, it, it, yeah, you have to really pay attention to what it's telling you to do, and you have to do everything that it's asking you to do. Now, you know, so uh, I, I had ups and downs, ins and outs. You know, finally I get a hold of this, this set of tapes, and, and uh, in the tapes it got very, very detailed about the mechanics of the steps. The actual process of the 12 steps, how you actually are supposed to do them, according to the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, another thing that was happening when I was first coming around is there was a lot of inventory forms. There was the Hazleton form. I mean, you know, every treatment center, every every uh, every recovery publisher had their own uh, had their own four step forms. And and you know what I what I came what I came to realize uh, why there's all these forms is basically because they can't plagiarize the big book. They can't just take the big book inventory and sell it. So they have to come up with something else, you know, and sell that. And there was forms on there, you know, have you ever had sex with farm animals? You know, I remember reading this one, like, what? You know, I I, I swear, some of these inventories. And, you know, they'd be handed out at meetings. No one had any real experience in the groups that I was going to back then. Um, but you go from surrender to the recovery process. Now, you admit that there's nothing you can do to stop the next drink from going into your body. That's step one. Okay? There's nothing you can do once you start drinking to moderate or end it. And your life is unmanageable across every level, emotionally, mentally, externally, in, you know, internally, every single way there's unmanageability in your life and unhappiness and emotional devastation and all that. That's the first step. The second step is, you know, come to believe that there's a power greater than yourself, that if you can tap into this power greater than yourself, you can be restored to sanity. You can become safe and protected from the next drink. You can begin to rebuild your life. In step three, you make a decision to engage that power greater than yourself. Then you start to look at the causes and conditions 
of your failure at life in the fourth step. They're chiefly resentments, fears, and the guilt, shame, and the remorse that comes from the things that we've done in the past to harm other people. You inventory that. You share that. You share that as uh, there, there's eight, eight statements in the book Alcoholics Anonymous warning you that if you hold anything back in this fifth step, it can, you can have little, there can be little or no effect on your recovery. So being absolutely brutally honest about every single dark cranny in my past, every resentment, every fear that I've had, every person that I've hurt, you know, if I become completely willing to share that, that'll take me to a place where I'll be willing to have God remove the defects of character. I have to humbly ask God to remove the defects of character. Then I need to place myself in the spiritual atmosphere where these defects of character can be removed. And the best spiritual atmosphere for my defects of character to be removed is to become willing to make amends to the people and the institutions that were harmed because of these defects of character and then actually go out and make direct amends face-to-face wherever possible, uh, direct amends to these people and these institutions. Now, when I've done that, everybody in here has heard the 12 promises, right? You know, no new freedom and a new happiness. Not wish to to shut the door in the past. You've heard them all, all, a hundred times in meetings, right? The 12 promises. Those are the ninth step promises. They materialize if we work for them. Before you're halfway through, before you're halfway through what? Through your amends. So, uh, So by the time I'm really running through the amends and I'm starting to use the disciplines of of step 10 and step 11 to seek through prayer meditation to improve my conscious contact with God and to use the tools that I've learned in the steps in a reactive way, whenever things jump out at me in life, I'll I'll handle them, you know, the step way instead of the Chris way, which which never got me anywhere except in a a, a room in my mom's. So... uh, By the time I get there, I've had a spiritual awakening. You know, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, you know what that really means? It means that until I've gone through these steps, I'm walking around asleep thinking I'm awake. My spirit is asleep. And all I can operate on is self. And self is my problem. My problem is selfishness, self-centeredness, always self-seeking. These are the things that have caused me my pain in my life. These are the things that have run me into the ground and caused my alcoholism. So going through these steps, all of a sudden my spirit begins to awaken. And, I, and really what that is, is it's, it's a shift in perspective. It's a, it's a changed perception. You don't see the world the same way. You don't react to the world the same way. You don't think the same way. It's, a, it's, like, a, it's like being completely reborn in a, in a different... You're the same person, but you're changed. You've had that personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism that they talk about in the doctor's opinion. And that's what the spiritual awakening is. And it also includes having a gazillion promises. Uh, The ninth step are just some of them. They aren't even the good ones. So what happens all of a sudden I've finished up my amends and I'm starting to pray and I'm starting to meditate? Something inside me is going to want me to carry this message. It's, it's almost incumbent. It's, uh, I'm almost being driven to carry this message. And when it says carry this message to others, you know, carry what message? Um, our, our literature, the book Alcoholics Anonymous, is very, very clear. To carry this message is basically to carry the message of, I was a hopeless alcoholic. I was, you know, I was in a lot of trouble. I went through the steps. I've had a spiritual awakening. I am a recovered alcoholic. I'm safe and protected from the next drink or drug based on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And, you know, uh, my, my life is, my life is wonderful today, you know, uh, 
And carrying that message to people is a message that they call a message of depth and weight. So often today in Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't, we're not cognizant of this. We don't pay attention. One of the real problems is we just don't pay attention. I was not paying attention for years. And my message was, was basically, don't drink, everything's going to be okay. If you're a real alcoholic, don't drink and everything falls apart. The alcohol is just a symptom of the alcoholism. You know, you take alcohol away from an alcoholic and don't give them anything back in return and they're going to fall apart. They're going to get to the point where they're suicidal. They're going to relapse or hopefully they're going to find a, a significant solution in their lives. You know, um, uh, it doesn't surprise me today when I see people relapse. Um, and this, the reason somebody relapses is always the same. They'll give you any number of excuses. You, you know, like, like I got arrested or she left me or she stayed. You know, I mean, you know, it, it can be, it can be any number, any number of reasons, you know, and, uh, uh, but the reason always is, you know, they failed to perfect and enlarge their spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, putting the needs of others ahead of their own. That's why you relapse. Okay? Every time. The alcoholic comes from a foundation of selfishness and self-centeredness. You know, that's why it's a selfish program. <laughs> you know, that, that really is probably my favorite. Re really, what it is, is it's a very selfless program. It's a program to defeat self. It's a program to remove that unhealthy self-drive that causes us all of our problems. So, to improve, uh, to, to, to improve and perfect our spiritual life requires discipline. It requires spiritual discipline. If you're the type of person who does not need to do that and yet stays sober and is happy, you're not what our book describes as an alcoholic. You're probably a very heavy drinker who had alcohol problems galore, and it's a good thing that you're here, you know, because we're, we're at least keeping you off the streets. But the book Alcoholics Anonymous, the book Alcoholics Anonymous was written for alcoholics, okay? And, and an alcoholic cannot just not drink, no matter what and not work a spiritual program. It, they become insane, they take their own life, or, or they drink again. That's what happens with an alcoholic who separates from alcohol without working on the real problem, which is their spiritual condition. That selfishness and that self-centeredness and that ego. So, Going through the steps, you understand this. I don't think there's, there'd be a lot of people who would argue any of the points I'm making here tonight. But none of them would be people who have actual experience with the steps. Anybody that's gone through the steps would be nodding their head. I know exactly what you're talking about. The people who would argue with me would be people who don't have any experience with the steps. Still have a, still have a spirit that's asleep and an ego that needs to stay in control. Now, when you wake up, when you recover from alcoholism, it's time to get to work because work and self-sacrifice for others is going to be your only hope. And that leads into tonight's talk, which is the disciplines of service. The disciplines of service. We need to find ways to become of service. The first and most obvious one is, is to become an experienced sponsor. Someone who will, who will take on sponsees, you know, and, uh, there's incredibly detailed instructions for how to sponsor in the chapter working with others. 
Okay? That was something I missed for years. I was just sponsoring by saying, yeah, here's my phone number. Give me a call if you feel like drinking. (laughs) If you feel like drinking, are you going to call somebody that's going to tell you not to? You know? Unbelievable. And, you know, or I'll see you at the meetings. And, you know, I thought that's, I thought that was good, good sponsorship. Well, after, after getting through the steps, I realized, I realized the depth of the problem. You see, I was so sick, I didn't even know I was sick until I had gotten through the steps. Because only once when you're healthy can you really look back on how sick you were with a, with a true perspective. So, one of the ways that you can be of service is, is to become a sponsor, an experienced sponsor, and uh, be somebody that, that takes other people through the steps. Uh, one, of the, one of the sad and killing things that's happening in Alcoholics Anonymous today is there's, there's a lot of people who are not experienced with the steps, and they don't do this on purpose. They just they don't have any experience or knowledge. What they'll do is they'll take on a real alcoholic as a sponsee and give them softer, easier ways and half measures. Like, you know, just, hey, I'll see you at the meeting. You know, give me a call. Just go to coffee. <laughs> you know? And, they'll, and the guy will die, you know? And, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll say something like, hey, he must not have really wanted it. You know, no, you killed him, you know? <laughs> You know, wake up, you know, wake up. So that's one of the saddest things that I've, I've seen today in, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, not everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous is, is, is an alcoholic of the description in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Probably, you know, they're in the minority. Most of the people who come into AA today are not anywhere near the the depths of the description of the alcoholic in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Again, I am saying that this is a good thing. Bill writes in in the first step in the 12 and 12, all of a sudden these people started showing up in AA who hadn't, they hadn't even felt the nip of the ringer, you know, and we we, we needed to figure out what the hell to do with these people. And and he goes, well, we decided to raise their bottoms, you know. And uh, so in 1950, if people were showing up in AA who weren't the real alcoholic, imagine today. Because you get thrown in here for having a DUI. Yeah. Listen, let, 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 let me just say this. Having five DUIs does not make you an alcoholic. Would it be possible that, uh, that you only drank five times, had a little bit too much to drink, and got pulled over? It's possible. It doesn't make you an alcoholic. You know, losing your job for drinking, does that make you an alcoholic? No, you, you know, you, you, you know, your boss might have come in and you, ha- you had your first drink in your hand and, you know, he didn't like you drinking. So, you found, I mean, those things, those external circumstances don't necessarily make you an alcoholic. The line in the, the first sentence in the chapter, we agnostic says, we hope we've made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. And then it says, if, when you honestly want to, you find you cannot give up drinking entirely, or if, when drinking, you can't control the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. That's that's about as simple as you can get. And, you know, a, a million people in my home group had an intervention, quit drinking, you know, first first time done, drink, never did any steps, went to a bunch of meetings, they were fine, you know, fine. That's not my experience. Uh, My experience was I was desperate to separate from alcohol. I knew it was killing me and I didn't want to die. And I signed myself into a treatment center paying my own money. You know what I mean? I I bought the $13,000 big book. And I went to the so I went to the 28 day program, and then they said, you know, you should do some aftercare. And so I went into the aftercare, and I listened to these knuckleheads share about how awful their lives were. You know, we sat around a group, 
You know, anybody, you guys have seen group, right? Where you just sit around and, you know, Chris, would you like to share? You know, and, and I was paying money for this because, because I just, I just didn't know what else to do. I mean, I, you know, I had surrendered. I knew I had to listen to somebody else, you know, so, so I had done the 28 day treatment. I was going to aftercare. I was going to some AA meetings because they suggested that I was telling everybody I'm done with drink. I'm done with drink. I was so serious about not drinking. And on the way to an AA meeting, the thought crossed my mind that a gallon of vodka would help me with all this sobriety stuff. You know, all this not drinking would really be fortified by a drink. Now, that's a real alcoholic, you know, somebody who's absolutely has done everything they they possibly can to stay away from booze and they find they can't. And, you know, unfortunately, that's a misunderstood individual today in AA. Alcoholics Anonymous has become a place where alcoholics are misunderstood. And you'll see the relapser coming in and out of the rooms, in and out of the rooms. They obviously want to stay sober. They're coming back. Would you, would you go back to a meeting, you know, after you drunk, got drunk and raise your hand and tell everybody you're a, you're a meathead one more time? I oh, drank again, you know. I mean, who wants to do that? So obviously they have a really strong desire to not drink, yet they're always drinking. You know, uh, what happens with those people is instead, instead of somebody engaging them and, and, and uh, capturing their attention enough to draw them in, to, to try to motivate them to go through the steps, what's happened is, you know, pe- people, people do this. You know, they, they don't, oh, there's that, that, that drunk guy again. You know, he's not being honest. You know, he doesn't really want it. 51% of him wants to get drunk, and only 49% wants to say it's over. Or, or any other chicken shit way of getting out of working with him. Um, those are the people Alcoholics Anonymous was designed to, to help. You know, over the course of time, over the course of time, it's just, it's become okay, you know, to to let somebody sit in the back row, languishing in the back row, and not hold them accountable to a program of recovery. And and it's good for the majority of people who don't want to do any work, but it kills the people who, this is their only shot, this is their only, only chance of survival is the spiritual process uh, inherent in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, okay, you've become a sponsor. You're an experienced sponsor. What happens is as you develop spiritually, you begin to develop new and improved skill sets. You you start to become more and more effective. One of the great promises in the 10th step is you're going to become more effective. You're going you're gonna to be able to do more with your life, not just in AA, in your work, in your family. You're going to become a more effective person. And when that happens, sometimes, sometimes we look for other ways to be of service. Now, in Alcoholics Anonymous itself, there's a service structure that you can get involved with. I think any of the 12-step uh, uh, fellowships have service structures. And the one in AA is, is quite unique. Uh, because the group is in charge, and the GSR, uh, uh, the, the group reports to the GSR and tells the GSR what they want. The GSR tells the DCM what the groups want. The groups want. The DCM uh, tell, tells, uh, goes up the line through the uh, the delegate and you know the the trustees all the way up to Alcoholics Anonymous World Service. And in other words, the fellowship is really in charge of the direction that Alcoholics Anonymous goes in through its, uh, uh, th- through its group conscience. The group conscience in AA is believed to be divinely guided. You get enough of us that are in recovery and we get together and our group consciences are usually 
the right direction. Not always, but usually. And you can get involved in any of these. There's, uh, there's all kinds of commitments for carrying the message into treatment centers. There's commitments to carrying the message into jails, institutions. So if you specifically want to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to have ample uh, ample opportunity to do this. Unfortunately, in New Jersey, most of these uh, most of these commitments go unfilled. I'm part of um, I'm part of District uh, 18. We're, we're Area 44, but I'm part of District 18. District 18 goes from Summit to Pottersville. It's a long, thin district, and it's been dark for almost five years. What that means is is there's been no DCM, and there's been no places for any of the GSRs to meet. If there are GSRs, they're, they're operating solo. They're like rogue GSRs. So, you know, you know, they got nobody to report up to. You know, they, they may be going to the, to the, you know, to the service, uh, meetings and stuff, but, but there's, there's no way for the group conscience in District 18 to, to move up the ladder because, because people don't want to do the work. You know, people don't want to get involved. And, uh, and, and it's said, so there's a lot of opportunities, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for that. There's opportunities, um, in your life to be of service. Our service ethic does not necessarily have to remain in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We need, we need it at a very, very deep level to go from always working for what we can get to putting the thoughts of others ahead of our own. <clears throat> and there's a million ways to do that out there. I mean, you can go from the soup kitchen to, I mean, there, there's just a million ways to be of service. You can be of service to your family. There can be sick people in your family and you can kind of, you know, spend a lot of time there. Whatever you do, Whatever you do to help other people where there really isn't a direct profit to you can be considered part of a service ethic. And this is part of having a spiritual awakening. This is part of being a recovered alcoholic. We're not operating from that selfish and self-centered uh, vantage point anymore. We're operating from a vantage point of love, service, and compassion. Now, when that happens... The craziest thing uh, is, and so often you can only learn this through hindsight, and, and it doesn't make any sense until you experience it, uh, but I can't tell you how many people I've worked with in, in the past who have been absolute, unbelievably wealthy. You know, I, I got sober in the Burnersville Mountain area, okay? You can't shake a stick without hitting a billionaire out there. And, and these guys could buy and sell me a hundred times over, and they go, Chris, did you help me? I'm really miserable. Did you help me? You know, I, the, it, the money and the cars and the big jobs... They were still crumbling inside spiritually. They were dying. And they had everything that they were working really hard for. And that stuff didn't make them happy. You know, that true happiness comes from working a spiritual program, whatever kind that is. You know, I recommend going through the steps. But after that, the world is your oyster. The people who are putting the needs of others ahead of their own are the happiest people I have ever seen. You know, some of these guys that were running corporations in Manhattan, you know, you'll now see them, you know, in Morristown at the soup kitchen on Sunday morning. I mean, they have learned, they've learned the importance of a service ethic to live you know, in on this planet with an attitude of compassion for others and giving. They've learned the true meaning of happiness. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous is not about tying you into anything. One of the one of the one of the saddest thing, things I've seen with, with home groups is home groups that want you to be absolutely loyal to the home group and have and have the sponsor have absolutely absolute authority over you and to just try to tie you in, you know, and, and, and take you hostage. Alcoholics Anonymous is about carrying the message of recovery through the steps, you know, helping somebody get through the steps and then allowing, allowing them to be free to follow a spiritual path. 
It's about offering you freedom, certainly happiness, certainly a new perception, a new attitude, and a new outlook on life. And, you know, I've experienced all this. There, there, are, there are my best friends in this world have experienced this. And we're living in the fellowship of the Spirit, and we are absolutely having a blast. And when we get to the end of the road, we're going to be able to look back on it. We're going to be able to say we made a real difference. We gave a lot more than we took. And that's important. Uh, if you're alcoholic, that's essential. If you're not alcoholic, that's still an unbelievably good thing to do. But we don't have the option to not do it. You know, we're, we're pretty much, I think that's what, I think that's what being a grateful alcoholic is. Grateful that I have to do all this stuff so I'll be happy. You know, I probably wouldn't have done it if I didn't have to do it because I didn't want to do any work. Anyway, uh, listen, it's the, you know, I want to thank uh, Susan again, Paul. Uh, um, uh, oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I am I'm out of my mind here. Um, I, want, I want to thank everybody that put this thing on. Lisa, Paul, I want to thank everybody that put this thing on. Um, it's been a really fun workshop for me. Uh, when, when it's all said and done and Bill puts all the, these packets of uh, CDs together, uh, pick it up because... Although we didn't go through every single mechanical movement uh, that you're that you're going to need to know going through the steps, we were certainly all enthusiastic about talking about it, and we can help create the enthusiasm you need to move through this process. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.